I'm honored to be here tonight in this great city and state known for taking brave political stands, like the first legal challenge to Donald Trump's proposed Muslim ban, and as we know, the Supreme Court has a problematic ruling today. And thanks, too, to the publisher of my books, um, Seven Stories Press in New York, which keeps the flame of independent publishing burning bright in these dark times. Well, the title of my talk tonight was originally The Danger of Apocalyptic Thinking, which then morphed into Optimism is Essential for Social Change. <laughs> While I prefer the latter, I really do, it's more hopeful after all. I think we need to understand the dangers of apocalyptic thinking in order to achieve the kind of practical, radical, inclusive optimism that is essential for social change. And that's the goal of my book. Apocalypse is in the air Americans breathe, <clears throat> blown on a swirling wind of religious prophecies, sci-fi movies, dystopian novels, doomsday prepper TV shows, bleak environmental predictions, and worst case national security scenarios. American apocalypse comes in both religious and secular forms though the line between them is fuzzy indeed and often hard to distinguish. You don't need to be an evangelical Christian to believe the end of the world is nigh. For example, physicist Stephen Hawking recently said that we only have 100 years to find a new planet or we're going to go extinct. Well, good luck on that. <laughs> um, of all the intertwining reasons for our apocalyptic disposition, and these are reasons that I explore in this book, the one that stands out most starkly is our acceptance of the inevitability and necessity of war. Opinion polls periodically reveal that a staggering percentage of Americans accept that the world will end in a battle in Armageddon. A 2010 Pew survey found that six out of 10 Americans see another world war as definite or probable by 2050. In the same poll, 41% of respondents said they expected Jesus to return to earth by 2050. A recent YouGov survey yielded a similar result with 64% of Americans expecting a major war soon and only 15% confident in world peace. From the Puritans' early wars against the Native Americans, to the brutal conquest of the West, to imperial adventures overseas, to the Cold War, and to today's state of permanent war, the drive for American empire predisposes us to believe in the divine providence of violence. Now each book is a journey of sorts. For those of you who write, you know this, surely. But for me, this one has been one of the longest, not just in terms of the time I've spent working on it, but the distances I have logged on the many winding, crisscrossing paths of the American infatuation with apocalypse. It has also been one of my deepest journeys, a personal quest as well as an intellectual and political one. I don't remember the day I definitively decided to write the book. The need to do it just overtook me. It ran me instead of me running it. Actually, I hadn't studied all that much American history. I had mainly studied South Asian history. It brought me back to the study of my own country. Um, throughout the book, I weave in my personal history as a child of the bomb, idealistic revolutionary, utopian back-to-the-lander, researcher in rural Bangladesh, international women's health activist and scholar, and peace and environmental justice advocate, deeply concerned about climate change. At the heart of my quest was a series of questions that had been gnawing at me for a long time. And I try to answer some of them in this book, but I don't completely answer them. And they continue to occupy me, and I hope I hear from you, too, what you think. Why had I been so apocalyptic as a child and young adult, and why do I still suffer from worst-case scenario anxiety? 
why can't we get over American exceptionalism, the belief that we're the world's chosen people and we can redeem and save the rest of the world? What are the promises and perils of the bright side of apocalypse, where there is a bright side, the new Jerusalem or golden millennium that beckons the righteous? Why is American environmentalism so susceptible to doomsday thinking and to racial and gender stereotypes of overbreeding violent poor people destroying the planet and coming to get us? Why is the American left so obsessed with purity and perfection? Why in one of the most abundant countries on earth do we have such a profound fear of scarcity with a capital S? And how does militarism feed and feed off our cultural propensity towards apocalypse and constrict our political imaginations, colonizing not only the present, but our vision of the future? As I got deeper and deeper into my research, I started to see a pattern to our apocalyptic mindset. And I'm going to read a few pages from the book to describe it. I name our apocalyptic bind the America syndrome. The syndrome is so normalized that its abnormalities are scarcely recognized. Ideology and psychology have spawned a national pathology of global significance. Although its parts are closely intertwined and the whole is much more than the sum of its parts, one can identify core elements of the America syndrome. These elements don't define all of American history, nor do we all share them. And also there are other countries who have um, some of these same synergies themselves. They're dominant traits, not universal ones. And I call them the seven deadly synergies. The first is American exceptionalism. The Puritans bequeath to us the confidence and hubris that we are God's chosen people called upon to save the world. America is at the center of the moral universe. Two, belief in a coming apocalypse. Pessimistically, we are headed toward a violent end. Optimistically, a golden millennium awaits us. In either case, history is an unfolding prophecy and time itself runs on a spiritual clock. Three, susceptibility to sermonizing. Perfected by the Puritans, a powerful form of political sermon called the Jeremiah continues to keep us trapped in the America syndrome. It castigates us for our sins and calls for repentance so that we may renew ourselves and fulfill the promise of America. Expansion number four, expansion, occupation, and empire. This land is our land, not yours or theirs. To reach our God-given destiny, war is just and extreme violence justified. To ease moral qualms, we paint ourselves as victims and the victims as perpetrators. We also see our enemies as racially, ethnically, and religiously inferior to the white Protestant ideal. Five, exclusion, inequality, and duality. In order for the chosen people to be who they are, they must distinguish themselves from those who they're not. Those who don't conform don't belong and should be punished or banished. Hierarchies are sanctified by the invisible hand of God as well as the invisible hand of the market. The world is sharply divided between good and evil, friend and foe. Six, nature as fractured mirror. We project onto nature the tensions and contradictions of our providential mission. Nature is seen as a wilderness to be tamed, a continent to be conquered, an apocalypse over the horizon, and at the same time a sublime landscape where we can escape the wounds of civilization and lift ourselves toward heaven. Seven, paranoia and anxiety. Last but not least, we see enemies everywhere. They even lurk inside us in dark and distressing emotions. No matter how hard we try, we can never be pure enough or worthy of our special place in the divine design. In the marketplace where money is worshipped as the marker of status, we are beset with anxiety that we will never have enough of it. Together, these deadly synergies comprise the America Syndrome. 
As the American empire declines, its ugliest symptoms, flexing our military muscle, tightening up our borders, punishing those who can't measure up, become ever more apparent. In the words of the Italian political philosopher Antonio Gramsci, the crisis consists precisely in the fact that the old is dying and the new cannot be born. In this interregnum, a great variety of morbid symptoms appear. Donald Trump's rise to power has drawn on and reinforced these deadly synergies and morbid symptoms in the body politic. His America First agenda, apocalyptic warnings about how terrorism could obliterate the U.S., demonization of Muslims and Mexicans, embrace of the white male conservative Christian mission, Twitter sermonizing, and constant fomenting of fear and anxiety carry the America's America's syndrome to its far right extreme. Understanding the America syndrome, where it comes from and what it does to us, individually and collectively, is a political challenge of the highest order. But even with strong cognitive defenses, it's hard to escape its emotional pull. It's manipulated by politicians, invoked by the mass media, and stoked by jeremiads that make us alternately into sinners and saints. What if Americans could come to understand that we're not so special after all? What if we could train our ears to hear echoes of the Jeremiah in political rhetoric across the ideological spectrum, like a recurring phrase in a musical score? What if we could better understand our own history with all its inanity and profanity instead of skipping from one myth or parable to another? Well, this book addresses these synergies and hopefully much more in six chapters, and I thought I'd briefly... um, tell you about those chapters. In End Times and Endless War, I look at why Americans are more predisposed to imagine the end of the world than the end of American war making. I focus on the way Ronald Reagan's foreign policy crusades in Central America and elsewhere employed the apocalyptic vision and political support of the Christian right. At the same time, the launching of the war on drugs began the process of militarizing domestic law enforcement and ultimately the mass incarceration of people of color. When 9-11 occurred, the body politic was already well prepped for the war on terror and the homeland security operations of George Bush Jr. that targeted Muslims and immigrants. In the second chapter, the Puritans, Pride and Prejudices of a Chosen People, um, I explore how Puritan leaders, convinced that they had a special covenant with God, set about to build a model Christian society, a city on the hill, that would show the world the way to the new millennium. Their legacy of American exceptionalism lives on in us. In Utopian Dreams, Millennial Madness, I look at the upsides and downsides of the two great ways of utopian experimentation in the U.S. from 1820 to 1850 and 1960 to 1980, incorporating my own experience in the Back to the Land movement in the 1970s. And this is one of the funner parts to write in the book. What lessons could we have learned from studying the past that could have helped us not repeat many of the eras of our forebearers? We might have realized, for example, that it's not so easy to bridge the divide between manual and mental labor or to build an egalitarian society on just one farm or commune or today in one corporation. We might have learned that inequalities between men and women don't evaporate overnight, and when male prophets have their heads in the clouds, it's women who hold up more than half the sky. We would have been warned that the quest for purity and perfection can lead in perverse directions toward intolerance and exclusion. And for those of us active in left politics, we might have been better able to tease apart Marxism's important insights about the nature of class society from its millennial promise of the inevitable victory of the proletariat and the establishment of a classless paradise. In Boom and Doom, The Magic of the Atom, I engage with the profound but often hidden psychological effects the threat of nuclear war had on my generation, effects that still manifest today. 
And to give you a flavor, I'd like to read a passage about the bomb's impact on my own childhood. I was born in 1951, the year that atmospheric tests of nuclear weapons began at the Nevada Proving Ground, later renamed the Nevada Test Site, 65 miles northwest of Las Vegas. The Atomic Energy Commission made no public announcements about the tests, even though they were powerful enough to light up the night sky over Los Angeles and San Francisco, and tourists came to Las Vegas and other nearby towns to witness the mushroom cloud. Thanks to the Nevada test site and other locations around the world where the Americans, Soviets, British, French, and Chinese exploded atomic bombs into the atmosphere, we all carry, carry radioactive residues in our bodies. According to a 2001 U.S. government report, if you've lived in the contiguous United States any time since 1951, all organs and tissues of your body have received some radiation exposure from nuclear fallout because of its lasting effects on the environment. Your degree of exposure isn't just a question of proximity to test sites, but also of which direction the wind happened to blow the day of the test or where it happened to rain. For example, there was a real hot spot in upper New York State. Maps of radiation exposure show higher densities around Nevada and neighboring states, but hot spots are sprinkled throughout the country. The government report estimates that excess cancer deaths from fallout exposure on av are likely to be the highest in persons born in 1951 because on average they received higher doses of radiation than people born either earlier or later. Well, from that perspective, 1951 is not a terribly auspicious birth year. But I was lucky in other ways, lucky to be born, in fact. In 1942, at the age of 19, my father was one of the first students to drop out of Princeton University to join the war effort. He became a Marine dive bomber pilot, flying more than 80 missions in the Gilbert and Marshall Islands in the Pacific. His plane was hit a number of times, but he made it home alive. Shortly after he returned to the U.S. in late 1945, he proposed to my mother, who was in graduate school at Iowa State University. They settled back in Princeton, where my father completed university on the GI Bill, and then became a history teacher at a local prep school. Sometimes my parents spotted Einstein sailing on Princeton's Lake Carnegie. My mother bore three healthy daughters, of whom I'm the youngest. A year after my birth, we moved to Wilmington, Delaware, where my father got a better paying job. Three years later, my mother developed malignant thyroid cancer. While it's impossible to pinpoint the cause, she was doubly exposed to nuclear contamination. Thyroid cancer is one of the most common cancers associated with fallout exposure, since radioiodine such as iodine-131 concentrate in the thyroid gland. A 1997 National Cancer Institute study estimated that exposure to iodine-131 from the Nevada tests alone led to between 11,000 and 212,000 additional thyroid cancers in the U.S., Risks risk of exposure were higher for those who worked directly with radioactive materials in the nuclear weapons complex. While my mother was studying agricultural economics at Iowa State, her best friends there, including my godmother, were doing secret research for the Manhattan Project at the university's Ames Laboratory. Beginning in 1942, the lab developed new methods for producing high-purity uranium. In the process, it generated radioactive dust at extremely high levels. There was little in the way of personal protection, engineering controls, or radiation monitoring to protect workers, though my godmother's job was to test the scientists' urine to gauge their exposure. Over six years later, the Department of Energy finally established a former worker medical screening program for the Ames Laboratory with possible compensation for 22 types of radiation-induced cancers. Thyroid cancer is on that list. So where did my mother's cancer come from? Fallout or exposure at Ames where she shared an apartment with my godmother and dated a Manhattan Project scientist before my father swept her off her feet? Was there radioactive dust on their hands or clothes or in the food they ate? 
Was she just genetically predisposed to cancer, or could it be all of the above? While I'll never know the exact cause, I do know something about the effects. In the 1950s, such things were not talked about openly with children, and my mother's diagnosis was a carefully kept secret from my sisters and me. But no matter how tight the container, fear has a way of seeping out. When my mother went to Boston for her operation, I came down with the flu. One of my first memories is of our favorite babysitter giving me a stuffed cat toy as I lay in bed recovering from fever. All through childhood, I clutched that cat at night, even after its fur and buttons, button eyes fell off and it looked like a blind old alley cat that had been in one too many fights. Fortunately, my mother survived, and she's still alive. She's 94. Life went on, though a sense of danger remained, a slight whiff of death that hung in the air. It was like in an upscale nursing home where they do everything they can to keep the floors and patients spotlessly clean, yet visitors can still smell the presence of the Grim Reaper. In our house, he hid in the shadows, but I knew he was there. Many years later, my mother told me that after her operation, her goal in life was to survive until I turned 16. When I look back now, I see my childhood in a kind of chiroscuro. When I was seven, we moved to Dallas, where my father became headmaster of an elite boys' school. Affluence surrounded us. The campus was a gigantic playground, and we swam in the pools of millionaires, diving into sky-blue chlorinated water and coming up for air in a world baked white by hot sun and racial prejudice. That incredible whiteness of being made my fears seem all the darker by comparison. I struggled for mastery over them by reading mysteries and then imagining and enacting my own as if I were Nancy Drew. When I got old enough to analyze myself in those heady college years when we stayed up late into the night discussing Freud and Jung, I latched on to my mother's cancer as a source of my early fears. But there was still a sense of a darker, deeper mystery left unsolved. It wasn't until recently, in fact, in writing this book, that I came to realize the grim reaper of my childhood wore more than one hat. I carried within me not only the fear of losing my mother, but of losing the whole world in a nuclear holocaust. How does one unbury one's nuclear fears, inspect them, catalog them, perhaps put them to rest? There's no easy answer, but sometimes something comes along to cast a little light. While researching the Nevada test site, I stumbled on a government photograph taken during a 1952 bomb test that shows two Marines lifting their hands to touch the mushroom cloud. You probably can't see it here, but the cloud is in the background and the two soldiers are lifting their hands as if they can touch it. The caption reads, the atomic cloud formed by the detonation seems close enough to touch and tension gone, Poth and Wilson do a little clowning for the camera. The irony, of course, is although they weren't close enough to touch the cloud, its radioactivity was close enough to touch them. Is that the metaphor I'm searching for? The bomb as magic show, with its illusions become delusions. The tricks up the atomic magician's sleeves not only steered us toward apocalypse then, but still delude the American body politic now. And the chapter proceeds to investigate those illusions and delusions. In the following chapter, The Church of Malthus, I turn my attention to another bomb, the so-called population bomb that many people still fear is exploding despite the fact that small families are becoming the, the global norm. The chapter builds on my career fighting for reproductive rights, including the right to safe legal abortion, uh, while simultaneously challenging the ideology of overpopulation and population control policies that violate women's health and human rights. The continuing belief, and it's still so pervasive in this country, that overpopulation is a primary cause of poverty, environmental degradation, and even war, fuels the larger apocalyptic fire. It also provides a smokescreen that obscures the social inequalities and injustices that drive so many of our present woes. In the last chapter, climate change tip of the melting iceberg. 
I look at the fine line between reading climate change as the end of the world, an updated version of the book of Revelation, and addressing it as an urgent challenge that requires political will and practical action at multiple levels from the local to the international. And I want to be very clear here, I think climate change is a huge problem, an urgent problem. We need to be doing everything we can to mitigate it um, and also to make sure that people can adapt um, to it and be more resilient in the face of it. So I'm very serious about climate change, but I don't think it's the end of the world. The specter of climate apocalypse is actually counterproductive. I mean, I understand it's easy to go there, especially these days with Trump in office. Um, but that specter often induces despair and fatalism. It is also dangerous. It plays into the hands of defense interests seeking to turn climate change into a national security threat that requires beefing up our borders and ceding ever more power and resources to the military so they can protect us. Environmentalists and climate activists, I argue in this chapter, need to be a lot more critical of sensationalist, sensationalist forecasts of climate wars based as they are on racialized depictions of poor people, especially poor Africans, as being naturally more prone to violence. And we're seeing um, today also um, this narrative about climate wars being applied to Syria, the Syrian civil war, which is a very political war and geopolitical war. And the idea that somehow climate change has caused the Syria war, we need to be really careful about that narrative, which is spreading, um, unfortunately, like wildfire. At the root of apocalyptic fears of climate change is a deeply pessimistic view of human nature. History shows that human beings can and often do cooperate in times of environmental stress. The late Eleanor Ostrom, the first woman to win the Nobel Prize in economics, documented hundreds of cases from around the world where communities make and enforce rules that protect natural resources against risk. And I wish, actually, we heard a lot more about Eleanor Ostrom than we do. An article in Nature Climate Change observes that in developing countries, climate change and ecological stress are normally treated as, quote, a problem to be solved, not a harbinger of apocalyptic violence as it is viewed by many analysts. The authors add, people in poor countries do not respond to bad weather by attacking each other. Rather than fearing the people most affected and afflicted by climate change, my chapter argues that we should support their problem-solving efforts and do everything we can to effect a rapid transition from fossil fuels to clean, renewable energy. Clearing our minds and hearts of the kinds of apocalyptic fears and prejudices I analyze in this book opens the way to a radical optimism of activism and solidarity. I wrote most of this book before Donald Trump became president. Now, like most of us, his election threw me into a state of despair. I will not deny it, and it still does. But I've also been heartened by the tremendous wave of resistance that is sweeping the country. When Ronald Reagan came into power in the early 1980s and the Cold War again threatened to get hot, it was the collective action of peace activists here and around the world that forced governments back from the nuclear abyss. So let's remember that history. Trump's withdrawal from the Paris Climate Accord is also inspiring collective action, like the formation of the U.S. Climate Alliance, spearheaded by Washington State, New York, and California, to ensure the U.S. meets its obligations to reduce carbon emissions. The Black Lives Matter movement, the immigrant rights movement, the feminist and LGBTQ movements, the economic and environmental justice movements, all these and more have made profound and positive changes to the American political and cultural landscape in recent years. So I'm not being a Pollyanna here, nor a wild-eyed wild utopian expecting a perfect future. I already did that in my 20s. <laughs> 
The challenges we face are formidable, and we all know that. But so are our collective energy and commitment, especially when freed from the unnecessary burden of the America Syndrome. Writing this book has helped me to lay that burden down, and I hope reading it will help you to do the same. It's a big relief. And I'd like to conclude tonight by reading one of my favorite quotes by the late historian Howard Zinn about the optimism of uncertainty. Some of you may already know this quote, but it cheers me up every day. An optimist isn't necessarily a blithe, slightly sappy whistler in the dark of our time. To be hopeful in bad times is not just foolishly romantic. It is based on the fact that human history is a history not only of cruelty, but also of compassion, sacrifice, courage, kindness. What we choose to emphasize in this complex history will determine our lives. If we see only the worst, it destroys our capacity to do something. If we remember those times and places, and there are so many, where people have behaved magnificently, this gives us the energy to act and at least the possibility of sending this spinning top of a world in a different direction. And if we do act in however small a way, we don't have to wait for some grand utopian future. The future is an infinite succession of presence, and to live now as we think human beings should live in defiance of all that is bad around us is itself a marvelous victory. Thank you. I don't know what I can say that Howard Zinn didn't just say, honestly. <laughs> um, to the rebuttal, I wish I was eloquent enough to, uh, to offer. I guess, I mean, the, the first thing that pops to my mind, um, isn't it possible to be extremely alarmed about our capacity to, uh, to what was the word, mount the political will uh, to actively combat climate change. Is it possible to be alarmed that we can pull that off and for it to have nothing to do with uh, fear of climate wars? I mean, I feel like that is, that's a particular uh, sort of strand of apocalyptic press that, I mean, I'm about to commit a grave logical sin, but I don't know anybody who thinks that. And I don't know anybody who thinks that that's the greatest danger of I, I think we fear uh, other ways of annihilation. So I, I, guess, um, I guess what I'm saying is it, it feels a little reductive to me to sort of make that the, um, uh, the, the turning point, really, for the, the, the climate change argument. I guess I feel like we've got real reasons to be worried about that and to be worried about our ability as a society to mount the political will to make practical decisions in the face of everything from leadership, uh, political leadership to uh, heavy corporate will that seems to be kind of stacked against us. Well, you must hang out with people that, <laughs> that, that, I mean, the climate war stuff is pretty big in certain circles, and especially in certain environmental circles. And it's partly, at least the circles that I uh, have been privy right. to, but um, it's partly that, there's a, there was a strategic decision made around 2007 um, by some environmentalists that if we talked about the threat of climate wars, it would help get the conservatives and the Pentagon on board with, like, um, you know, cap-and-trade legislation in the U.S., so that appealing to security, national security right. issues, was a strategic way to go. Right. So there's that. Um, and also this whole idea that there are going to be all these climate refugees um, circling the globe. The Pentagon did sure. this uh, 2003 scenario say, of abrupt climate change where all these, you know, we really need to strengthen our borders against these climate refugees. And you saw a lot of hype about climate refugees too. Now, I, I think there will be climate, um, you know, related migration. There already is. But actually a lot of that um, researchers show that a lot of that will be within countries, not um, across borders. Order so much, right. so you see see this in national security circles and in environmental circles, and a lot of people also believe this stuff because there are certain old narratives, colonial narratives, about poor people, especially in Africa, being more prone to violence and not to cooperation in times of stress. And a lot of this literature, for example, doesn't look at, at, at 
the possibility that people are, can cooperate. I think if any, I mean, you just hit a point where I think people feel like, at least those of us who live in the Northwest, well, we've got all the water mm -hmm. and we have this temperate clime. And if we have anything to fear, it's from Arizonans, <laughs> right? It's not from, um, I fear yeah. Arizonans for a lot of other reasons, but that's not. Um, I, I'm sort of curious, uh, this is almost a side note, but it might bounce back into something useful. But you, you, you said uh, that there are other countries that embody the America syndrome. And I'm kind of wondering who you have in mind and is there... Uh, is it, is, are there other countries at this particular moment in history, or are you taking an historical perspective when you make that observation? Right. Well, I didn't want to say that it was the America syndrome is those seven things kind of operating together right. synergistically. But um, a question came up actually at my first reading. Well, don't other countries have some of these attributes, like exceptionalism, or you think of British colonialism, for example, and the kind of nationalistic narratives that still permeate culturally as well, that we're better or that, you know, we had a right to colonize. So I'm just arguing that some of these things you can find in other places, certainly apocalyptic thinking you can find in other countries too. But it's the way these seven synergies kind of intertwine and the role of our particular history, especially with the Puritans, that I'm We're unique about. in having the whole package. Yeah. That sounds like American exceptionalism. <laughs> <laughs> a little bit. A little bit. Um, yes. So, which... And, and I don't mean this to sound glib, but um, because I personally uh, 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 I, I um, recoil at American exceptionalism when it's expressed mm -hmm. as an idea by, oh, say, my relatives at Thanksgiving, which comes up a lot. <laughs> um, it does. But uh, 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 it seems like a kind of a, the, the, the positive flip side of that is this kind of perhaps irrepressible idea that our society is perfectible and uh, it, the, the, the upside to what you're mm -hmm. to exceptionalism is a belief that we can summon the will to make this place be uh, its best self. It's just the real issue we have is with that definition of what constitutes our society's best self. And also that we're not so much better than everybody else. Well, sure. So, yeah, so sure. I think that's part of it. And also, I think the striving for perfection that really you see beginning with the Puritans, I think if we can get over the perfectionism and the purity, and we need to make a better country. And as I was writing this book, you know, or actually uh, when I was finished and Trump won the, the election, and then you had the Muslim ban, and then you saw the courts coming in to actually, pro you know, to you know, the separation of powers actually working. Right. And I thought, let's talk about what elements in our, um, you know, our country that are really effective and good in our democracy. Um, and, um, but we don't have to label them exceptional, but they're, they're important and they are perhaps, you know, can guide, um, a, a, they're a good example for others as well. But we shouldn't expect everybody to be just like us. Of course not. Yeah. Yeah. I, maybe I see, of course, I assume. Uh, uh, I've only got one more question, so folks should start to come to the mics. Um, uh, as I ask about the susceptibility to sermonizing, um, a bit ironic um, uh, when we think of a country that we like to talk about having been a found, founded on principles of religious freedom, but, uh, and, and, and presumably the freedom to be, from, you know, freedom from religion too. Um, talk about that as a uniquely American trait in particular, uh, or is it a uniquely American trait? Is that one of the things you see replicated in other countries? Uh, well, that's a good question. Well, I think there are a lot of countries that are nominally secular that have a strong religious undercurrent. Right. You know, um, for example, I lived in Bangladesh, which is supposedly a secular country, but strong um, it, it, uh, it now increasingly an Islamic fundamentalist kind of movement trying to desecularize the state, right? So, but it's more than just overtly, overtly faith-based governance. That yeah, we're talking. Yes, it's yes, an undercurrent. Yes, and I think what we have to see here is that even though we are supposedly have a separation of church and state, that this um, kind of American civil religion, it's called, you know, that... Um, Basically, it's a kind of providential um, idea that we are kind of, you know, we need to fulfill our destiny, our God-given destiny. And it doesn't necessarily have to be specifically Christian, but, um, you know, I said the founding fathers were deists. They believed in kind of, a, kind of God directing right. things. And I think that is so much part of our culture. 
I mean, it's, I'm, I, you know, it's part of, it was part of my own mindset, right? And I was bought, brought up as a Unitarian secular, mm. but that kind of, um, you know, that we have a God-given mission here and that we need to live up to it and that kind of time is providential and those, and our government, th those, and, and politicians using sermonizing very effectively to mobilize. Sometimes, you know, um, Martin Luther King used sermonizing very effectively in a, in a positive way, but I think we're a little too susceptible to sermonizing, and we need to, you know, my husband even says, I delivered Jeremiah, so I'm now saying that you know, if we get over apocalypse, everything will be okay. So anyway, anyway we have to be really careful of um, uh, how those messages affect us, because I think we hear them, and then they inspire us in a certain way, but they also bring up kind of the America syndrome that's so much part of our mental architecture. I, uh, to that point, I... Uh moved from Virginia to one of the most famously unchurched parts of our country and um, uh, grew up very religious and find it necessary. I take my children to church a few times a year, frankly, so that they don't think people who are religious are space aliens. Uh, it, 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 it feels important to me to preserve uh, a foundation of the capacity for belief, if you will, even in this part of the country where it's possible. I, I sincerely believe it's possible to uh, to make the choice to embrace religion here or to reject it utterly in a way that it it's more part of the groundwater, if you will, where I grew up. But I find, you know, when you talk about um, uh, what we inherit in our childhood and what sort of ends up in our, I, I find uh, a personal need to uh, share that with my children, lest this society here that I'm living in fails to authorize them to make that choice for themselves. Does that make sense? Yeah, that makes sense. And I, I certainly don't mean this book as an attack on religion. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it's, but it's really looking at these kind of deeper undercurrents of political ideology that are influenced by a religious tradition um, and an apocalyptic religious tradition. And not all religious traditions and not all Christians are apocalyptic. So uh, those are a handful of things that interested me. I wonder if other folks have other questions that you want to pose. Uh, yeah, if you don't mind, or holler it to me, and then I'll bounce pass it to her or something. Hi. I understand that being optimistic, it's important for bringing about social change. I've been fairly active in this for the past decade or so, but now I just don't care anymore for the past year, and I wonder how I can bring myself to be motivated again? That's a good question, because I, I know what you mean. And, and, you know, sometimes we do need to take breaks, you know, and also find ways to restore ourselves in whatever form that is, whether music or taking a walk in the woods or whatever. But I actually think when you work along with people, now it's not always perfect and not always pure, and I try to say this, politics is a messy business. But, you know, let's say you're working together is just an example from my town of Amherst, Massachusetts. People came together across kind of, you know, town government, schools, um, community to make Amherst a sanctuary town, you know? Um, and and I, it was a real coming together of the community in a way where there's often fractious political battles. So sometimes forms of collective action, I, I certainly found like um, protesting against nuclear weapons in Europe during the 80s and the Reagan administration. I was living in England at the time. Was It really um, made me feel more positive just to be in a crowd of people really protesting and having an impact in the end. So maybe finding those spaces where actually you like to work too um, um, and that, you know, you enjoy the work, you enjoy the people that you're working with and it helps kind of restore your faith in humanity, but it's also okay to take a break. Thank you. <laughs> Good evening. How are you? Hi. Hi. I may have misunderstood um, you were talking about overpopulation, and what I understood you to say is that overpopulation is not an economic, social, political threat which I just, if I misunderstood, mm -hmm. if you could just elaborate on that, or if you do claim that, again, your reasoning, because I, I don't agree with that, because I, I do feel it's a threat, so if you could just elaborate a bit more, I'd appreciate it. Sure, um, yeah. I think 
population growth um, has different effects in different places at different historical times, and you really need to break it apart. There's not one universal law to, to the effect of population growth on the economy, the environment, et cetera. And certainly today, we are converging on a world of small families. You know, population growth rates have gone um, way down. A lot of Americans aren't even taught that in school. They're taught the population is still exploding exp exponentially. It, it's not growing exponentially. Um, we are having absolute increases in population the, um, these days, partly because there is such a large cohort of young people um, of reproductive age, especially in the global south, who are um, having children. But that said, most of them are having two children or maybe even less. Um, there are still some high fertility countries, um, but not very many, and also fertility is declining um, in those countries as well, especially in urban areas. So um, it's not, I think we need to understand demographic dynamics better. And certainly from my own experience living in Bangladesh, you know, in the 1970s, I, I described this in the book, we lived in a village in Bangladesh, and uh, the average uh, family size was seven. Um, people had to have a lot of children because so many died. You know, one in four children um, died uh, uh, before the age of um, five. And um, so there was a need to have children. There was not education. Women didn't have opportunities outside the home. And then as Bangladesh urbanized and developed more, and especially as child mortality went down, you found um, Bangladesh now has a birth rate of about two children per you know, family. So if you look around the world, that's happening. So what I don't, and we're going to see an increase in population for the next, you know, um, well, the demographers differ, but, you know, let's say the next 40, 50 years, we're going to see this increase, but it's partly because there's so many young people having children. But as they age and their children have fewer children, we're actually going to see population stabilization. So for me, it's not the biggest issue. Um, to face. And certainly I support family, international family planning, access to abortion. Here, there, everywhere. Women deserve it. Men deserve it. Adolescents deserve it. Um, but uh, incorporated into a larger um, health system that respects reproductive rights. Um, so I'm against coercion. I like the one-child policy in China, for example. So, um, and you can, birth rates come down without coercion with social and economic change. Yes. Go for it. I want to say something about optimism. It's very generational. I think a lot of folks under the age of 15, say, are much more optimistic mm -hmm. than, like you said, when I grew up, I thought about the bomb quite a bit, and I thought about Khrushchev, and I thought about communism. Folks who are under the age of 15 were so young during the George W. Bush years, that it didn't make sense to them. They, they, they couldn't take it in, like folks, say, who are now in their 20s or 30s. And the hope for this country is in people under the age of 12, I think. They're much more optimistic because they haven't had to theorize or had theory thrown at them about the apocalypse. And the fact that those kids need to be taught an optimistic lesson and be able to sustain that optimism is very, very important. They look at, they can't understand the abortion problem at all. They can't really understand, um, they can't fully understand global warming because they haven't had experience hearing about it. I heard about it from the time I was 10 or 12. But they can be optimistic maybe because they don't know enough about tragedy. And so it's very important, I think, that every kid in America under the age of 15 read your book mm -hmm. because they'll be, able to, they'll be able to see it from a different, a, from a different perspective, but they'll be able to retain that optimism. Okay. And I, I think that's very, very important that we focus on kids under the age of 15. We can't ignore them. They've come up in a very different sort of world than we did. And their optimism could be a very, very potent thing. Can I just chime in really quick? I have a 10-year-old and an 8-year-old at home, and they're acutely aware of climate change, actually. Well, they, they are. are. And um, as are all of their peers. 
Good. And I will say that they're not, they think that we're going to solve it. Good. They're, um, they're scared and they wonder why people who don't acknowledge climate change are allowed to occupy positions of power <laughs> um, and to be intransigent. But I, they are very aware of it. Uh, again, I'm going to speak. Every child I know uh, is acutely aware of it. Um, but, there, but, there's a, um, but there is that intrinsic optimism that it's something that can be solved if only we can get, get bad people out of the way and get good people into the way. Yeah. I don't know if you have anything you want to add to that. Yeah. Well, their optimism could be labeled pragmatism, yeah. which I think is a very positive thing. They're much more mature in so many ways than folks over the age of 30, you know. I also think environmental education is really important in schools, you know, starting from kindergarten on up. So, and I think partly also we're seeing if, if students have access to good environmental education, then they are much more aware of the pro problems of climate change and what can be done about it. Thanks for, thanks for spending your time with us tonight. Thank you. Um, how do, you, how do you think that the idea of partisanship, which is something that's very unique to America and American culture, almost unlike any other nation, um, how do you think that that prevents us from being optimists and feeds into this, um, feeds into the sort of hysteria that you were talking about? Thank you. Well, I think there are other countries that are very, uh, have a lot of partisanship too, but I think, you know, sometimes I think if we had a, um, parliamentary system and there were more parties that you know that one could find um, if you're not comfortable with either the Democratic or Republican that you might be you know in the Green Party in the Green Party or another social justice formation that would have some clout in the political spectrum um, so I think it's tough in this country especially also that elections have become you have to have so much money to run for office I think that's really perverted the system in a way. Um, I lived in England for a while, and people running for parliament on the Labour Party ticket, for example, didn't need to have a lot of money to run for office. So you had school teachers and social workers running for members of parliament, whereas that's become increasingly difficult to do here in the United States. So I think we leave a lot of people out the way that money so um, you know deforms our uh, politics. Hi, <laughs> welcome to Seattle. Um, so the, the question about youth uh, made me think a lot of what I was, one of the things I'm most excited to finally get to read your book is that over the last few years I've spent a lot of time with the young friends in my life and my nieces who are 11, 17, and 20 reading all of the, you know, apocalyptic young adult novels that there are. Um, <laughs> and becoming completely obsessed with them and having this bonding experience with them and these badass female characters mm. surviving the apocalypse and saving everything, um, all the while having this like, oh no, is this the right narrative? Like what are we doing to ourselves and inspiration and doom? And So I'm just wondering if you can kind of touch on that and that just uh, popular culture of the apocalypse and, and how, we're, how we counter that. Right, good question. And Meredith is one of the reasons that I stay optimistic too. Yeah. <laughs> I worked with Meredith in, at Hampshire College. She does great work. But anyway, um, yeah, I, that's a hard one. Like I started reading The Hunger Games and I couldn't get through it. But, you know, for me, in my generation, as I said, it was like Nancy Drew solving mysteries, you know, but now you've got to like be a superhero and, you know, um, you know, and you've got to be violent, you know, I mean, in a way the book has a message of anti-violence, but it uses violence as a way to get there. So what I don't like about it is, uh, I mean, you know, people have different tastes in literature, so I don't want to criticize all dystopic literature. And I think, you know, some of it can be quite useful and, um, but I don't quite, I don't like it very much. But, I just wonder, it's the violence that really gets me in those books. I mean, it's almost like our imaginations are so militarized. I mean, that's, that's one thing that came through doing this book. I'd done some work um, after 9-11 on the kind of um, uh, how our imaginations get militarized. And um, 
I just think some of these books really reflect that. And you're living in a society, we're in a state of permanent war in this country. And so it makes sense that then that would become kind of the context in which a story is told, right? But are there ways that we don't need to use such grotesque violence in these dystopian books? That's what I would argue, I guess. But it's good to have women superheroes, <laughs> heroines, so it's tricky, right? <laughs> Good evening. Um, I guess I kind of have two things that were coming up for me. Um, one was, honestly, your, your event caught my eye. I'm just randomly looking for things this evening. And having grown up with a father who's older, he was born in 35, I grew up with my dad being a survivalist. So this is like the very the microcosm, right, of things in that um, I have to admit, you know, I'm, I'm 37 now. I still have moments where I look around and that filter yeah. drops down and you see, you know, what would this look like if, as my dad says, the shit hit the fan? Um, and so I grew up with that and grew up trying to figure out, how, Dad, how do, I, how do I talk to you about the fact that not everybody's going to suddenly go after everyone else if something bad happens? Right. You know, we, we watched what parts of Japan did after their nuclear issue, and, you know, people came together. Right. So it doesn't have to go that way. So my one piece was around, you know, how do we talk to those people in our lives who are really heavily sunk into it. And he says he doesn't spend that much time on it, but it's what he talks to me about every time I visit. Um, so that was one piece. And the other piece was you were talking about, um, I, I guess we'll say viewpoint maybe, um, this, this American syndrome. But how do we, instead of just defining ourselves, um, it's like when you're a teenager, I am not my family, you figure out who you are in opposition. But how do we get to that point where we're beyond the we're not that, and open it up and say, we're not just against that or opposite that, but there's really all these other options. Yeah. yeah. Oh, well, Thank you. Really good, really good questions. One thing, you might give your father a book for Christmas called A Paradise Built in Hell by Rebecca Solnit, which is about be, um, people's behavior during disasters, which shows that actually it's the forces of law and order that tend to behave badly and, you know, the community people tend to come together. It doesn't always happen, right? You don't want to build a whole kind of idealized. But, you know, people often do work together during disasters. So I think you could maybe show them that, and she has case studies of that. Um, yeah, and, and um, the, the other question. Well, one thing is, I think it's just a process, you know, getting rid of this stuff. I still have a worst-case scenario mentality, you know, and... I, but when it comes up now, I do. I kind of laugh at it, you know, and say, "Oh, there it goes again in my brain," and or I get really scared about something, and uh, I try to, I just try to um, use logic and analysis to get myself through it, and a bit of humor never hurts either, um, and. Uh, but I, there's no one aha moment. I guess that's the thing. And we're never going to, you know, I think we need to strive to have a better country. I think we need to strive to rid ourselves of some of these. I mean, they're almost like unnecessary anxieties. So if one can rid themselves, it doesn't, like, it just opens room to be less anxious and maybe be more hopeful and also just feel more hopeful about your activism, I guess. So for me, it's not, you know... It's not the answer, but it, it helps. Because I don't know about you all, but I have really been weighed down by this, because especially being born during the nuclear era, I've been weighed down for a long time. So this book, I mean, I felt compelled to write it, not so much because I you know, thought, oh, I can come up with the historical answers for this, but I just felt like it would be really good for me to understand where a lot of my um, kind of baggage came from. I think the height of optimism is that you think her survivalist dad is going to read Rebecca Solnit, yeah. which is awesome, but let us know how it goes. Yeah. Hi. Thank Hi. you for this. I actually missed the first half, so uh, I apologize for um, showing up late, but I was optimistic that I'd still get something out of it the second half. Um, and that Zen quote was, was wonderful, uh, just to just hits home, you know, whenever, whenever it kind of gets brought up to the surface and you think about uh, kind of activism, demonstrating, uh, volunteering, all those things aside, just how you conduct yourself 
on a day-to-day -day basis, how you engage with the world, that positive energy that you send out, you know, I think it goes a long way, just the, those in, invisible ripple effects that you can't quite quantify. And if you could, we'd probably all kind of conduct ourselves differently, you know, and I think that goes a long way. Um, but I, yeah, I suppose, and this can't help but be general here, but this is, I guess, a how-to question in dealing with that pessimistic friend of yours who uh, has, a, has a knack of bringing you down when you're... Uh, when you're trying to do your part, you know, however, however big, however small, and typically kind of reverts back to that historical kind of narrative of history repeating itself. Yeah. Um, and like the mouse experiment, like the mouse utopia experiments in the 70s, you know, just the, the population growth kind of leads inevitably to, to apathy, indifference, um, you know, uh, separation of, of, of different groups, all those kinds of things. Um, and then the rise and fall of empires, you know, that bell curve where, you know, we just kind of go up and then we kind of go down. And um, so I guess confronting those kind of notions and how do you, you know, best kind of go about that and, and saying this, is, this isn't necessarily history, this is just now. And how do you, you know, kind of compare or contrast that with what's, what goes on traditionally? Right. Well, I think one thing is to break down not to look at all humanity as one big blob, you know, or mount a bunch of mice or whatever, you know, kind of break down the human species and like they're rich and poor people, they're men and women, they're power relationships. And so let's look at every period of history, let's look at the power relationships and what happened, who, do, you know, and, uh, you know, I think that's one thing Howard Zinn does in his work of the history of the United States. So I think if we better understand history, and we don't have this view that, you know, it's just humanity with a capital H that's going to hell with a capital H and a handbasket with a capital H. But break it down, you know. Okay, so who's doing the most damage to the planet, you know? And let's look at the role of the fossil fuel industry. Let's look at the role of the politicians who support the um, fossil fuel industry. Let's work, look at the Koch brothers. Let's look at our political processes. Let's look at Donald Trump. I mean, let's break it down, right? Um, and that we're not all bad, right? And humans aren't necessarily bad, and humans aren't necessarily out to destroy the planet or take over the planet or, you know, so get away from those easy models too. You know, I've studied Malthus and population for many years, and so our notions of caring capacity, for example, are problematic. This kind of iPad equation, you know, impact equals population times affluence type technology that really, um, you know, the limits to growth, for example, was based on that. There are these models that become kind of fixed um, in our minds as the truth. Um, and we steer away from political economy. So for me, actually, studying political economy wherever I am and in whatever period has been really helpful in understanding how the world works. And, and people's relationship to the environment as well. People's different relationships to the environment, I should say. We have time for both of your questions. Hi. Um, I might be asking you to help me play devil's advocate here for a moment. Um, but I'm sort of wondering, as you talk about um, our tendency toward the Jeremiah or these mm -hmm. prophecies of doom and fate, um, whether there's not a position that's maybe more, even more secular or more academic than that, that's opposed to optimism in that it's a pessimism, but it rejects that sort of teleological thinking, which is about anything's faded, or it would oppose metaphors mm. of history unfolding in a fixed way, um, but would also sort of stand apart from optimism um, for the reason that the optimism, I feel, maybe can lead sometimes to thinking that we have what we need right now um, to do what we need to accomplish, that what we have is sufficient for that, and that in some cases, take uh, climate, for example, maybe what we need is a very radical um, reassessment or overhauling of the way we think about our relationship to nature. Um, and that requires maybe thinking that we, we don't have what we need right now. We, we aren't prepared to make that big jump. Is there a, a position which isn't optimism, but which isn't a sort of faded Jeremiah? Yeah, I, I think so. Yeah. And, um, or, or let's define, uh, maybe it's optimistic to think that we can get that position that you're talking about, right? So there are different kinds of optimism, right? But the kind of, you know, optimistic thing that everything's just going to be great, we don't need to worry about anything. I don't like that kind of optimism myself, so, and, and, I, and I get your point. Yeah. But I think in being critical of the kind of Jeremiah, that's helpful in opening more space to develop the kinds of things you're talking about. Hello. 
Um, so I feel like I've been able to be really optimistic in the way that you describe since the election um, until this morning. And partly the optimism has been because I've trusted in the good people and the activism and the law. Um, and then this morning when I heard uh, that about the partial yeah. uh, ban that the Supreme Court is allowing to go through, I really kind of fell apart and I feel like I'm an anxious mess. And you know, when I go back <laughs> to my therapist, she's going to say, who, do you, who, who wants to talk first, you or me? Because <laughs> we talk a lot. I stole that from a, somebody else. It wasn't my joke. But um, I, don't know, I don't know what to do. I don't know how to think about this. Because the trust that I've had in how things have been unfolding, I don't, it's just, I'm a, I'm a mess. So. <laughs> well, well from what I, you know, I, have, I read some stuff this afternoon, you know, um, but it seems that what the, the Supreme Court has done, I mean, it, it, when they finally make a ruling, that's when we'll either be really depressed or, you know, because um, uh, this one sounds like it's a little fuzzy um, what's in place now. You have to prove that you have some bona fide connection to the United States or something. So I think there's going to be a lot of room for maneuver and for law cases. And we need, uh, we still need a lot of activism at airports, on the streets, uh, uh, um, protecting uh, immigrants and refugees. So for me, it's, this isn't totally unexpected. Um, what just happened, but it just means we're going to have to um, up the political pressure um, and keep moving. So, and I think that's one way to kind of channel one's anxiety. I'll, I'll wait for your amended chapter. <laughs> thank, you. thank you. I think one way you can channel your anxiety is to hang out with people in this room a lot more. There are a lot of people who share it, just so you know. Uh, if you're, of course, that's only for four more days, and then you're on your own because we're. Um, I'm going to hijack the last couple of minutes by posing a question that I'm sure is on everyone's mind. Where, why the hell did you want to do this tonight? What made you think you were qualified to go sit on stage? Well, it was not um, because I knew that by doing what I just did, uh, I would prove my principle that the questions generated by this audience are truly extraordinary uh, and show me up <laughs> in the process um, because that was a fantastic conversation you all just brought to the fore. But I was drawn to talk to you um, uh, because I really feel like since November 8th, um, uh, it's impossible to live in this city um, without um, uh, an awareness of... Uh, how uh, desperate people are for a feeling of, uh, of optimism, of common purpose, uh, of regaining, uh, regained momentum. Um, and uh, if there's anything Town Hall has tried to do <laughs> over the last seven months, uh, it's to be a place where people can, where you can uh, declare loudly uh, that thing that you intend to do with your little corner of the city. Um, where you can, we even at one point solicited personal platforms for people where you could uh, say what you intend to do over the next four years um, uh, and make that commitment as a, as a public commitment. Um, so um, all of that is to say I wanted to be a part of the conversation tonight because I think the work of this organization over the last six months has been uh, uh, to help people find their own optimism, find their own sense of personal purpose in that that piece of their world that uh, they can make a difference in and to come together with other people who uh, um, are looking for the same thing in their lives right now. So um, it was an honor to be in the room with you tonight and to learn more about it. And uh, I'll pick up a copy of this and uh, go deeper. Thank you so much, Betsy. And thank you all. Thank you.